Good morning, everybody. Um, it is a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Link Calabres from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Dr. Calabres has been really a major presence in the rheumatic diseases on many different fronts. You'll see, I guess, the newest one uh, today, uh, a very important one in terms of the side effects uh, of our autoimmune and rheumatic side effects of cancer immunotherapy, you know, a critical area uh, also of great interest uh, to us. Dr. Calabrese is professor of medicine at the Lerner College of Medicine of the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western, uh, where he holds two endowed chairs, the Facing Major Chair and the Claysen Chair uh, as well. He is also the uh, vice chair of the Department of Rheumatic and Immunological Diseases at the Cleveland Clinic and the director of the Face Major uh, Center for Clinical Immunology there. Again, over the years, he's had contributions in many different fields, uh, including uh, the interface between infectious diseases and rheumatic diseases on HIV, PML, Hep C, and a number of other topics. Also great contributions to CNS vasculitis in particular. And today he's going, as I said, going to be talking about a major issue in uh, medicine today. Dr. Calabrese. Thank you, Inaki. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Welcome uh, from uh, up north. Um, I am going to talk about uh, a new area of uh, disease, a new area of, uh, of medicine. I think it's very exciting. I am sure that at this conference you've had discussions uh, about the, the prospects of uh, and the advances in cancer immunotherapy. Uh, so I'm going to turn this a little bit and talk uh, about the dark side, or the uh, at least the, the counterweight of these advances uh, that we're, we'll refer to as immune-related adverse events, or IRAEs. And uh, you know, uh, it is not coincidental that uh, I'm not an oncologist, and I think that this domain is really, uh, while oncologists uh, are are uh, the, in the driver's seat. There's a, a major need for interprofessionalism uh, to both uh, manage these patients as well as try to find out um, uh, uh, how to prevent them and, and optimize care. Any oncologists here in the audience today? All right. So I'm going to divide this into a few different stanzas. Uh, give you a little snapshot of the uh, history of immunotherapy for cancer. Then um, I'm going to talk to you, get a little uh, immunology boot camp of the uh, fundamentals of checkpoint therapy and, and uh, the ramifications of uh, attacking them. And then I'm going to uh, go through this in a way that uh, is appropriate for medical grand rounds, uh, looking at multiple specialties and um, uh, trying to uh, uh, demonstrate some of the more common adverse events um, and raise uh, some of the uh, important clinical questions that uh, confront us. I'll talk a little bit about uh, mechanisms, because we know so little, and then I'll try to talk about this interdisciplinary approach moving forward. So cancer immunotherapy uh, uh, is, uh, you know, like any other area of medical history. You, you look into the constellation, you pick out a few bright stars, but the the, the beginning of this in terms of uh, a, a real practical application came uh, with uh, William Coley, who practiced uh, at the New York Hospital, the forerunner of Memorial. And in the late 19th century, um, he was known as a head and neck surgeon, cancer specialist, and he had made uh, these anecdotal observations that uh, from time to time, patients who had had head and neck cancer uh, who got uh, either a respiratory infection or uh, head and neck erysipelas, uh, that he thought that their tumor regressed. So he started on a process of uh, discovery and therapy, um, um, uh, starting by injecting uh, live uh, uh, streptococcus uh, into these tumors, which uh, didn't work too well, but then uh, uh, modified this in uh, t taking extracts of multiple bacteria that ultimately were called Coley's toxins. And these were mar marketed by Park Davis for decades. Um, he wrote a paper. Um, this is one of the uh, 
uh, uh, real, uh, you know, uh, key observations. This man that, that clearly had some uh, regression of uh, what was known to be a, a, a malignant uh, tumor. Um, he made these observations on about 30 patients and then gave them to thousands of patients over the ensuing decades. Mechanism totally unknown. If you kind of flash forward that to now and you go back and, and look at some of uh, uh, the, the fits and starts of immunotherapy, uh, there were many. Uh, and up until 20 years ago, uh, 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 mechanisms were still poorly uh, understood. Actually, in the 80s, uh, just across the street at the Rockefeller in the, the Olds lab, um, uh, the, the cytokine uh, responsible for tumor necrosis, TNF, uh, was identified, uh, interestingly, in the same uh, area as uh, where Coley has uh, done his work. Cell transfer, immunization, BCG, uh, cell extracts, transfer factor, uh, all fits and starts. Uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, attempts at immunotherapy, the infamous uh, TGN experiment of driving T cell activation um, uh, 12 years ago uh, set the uh, whole field back. And then through a, a series of observations and remarkable clinical trials in 2011, the first uh, drug of the class that I'll be referring to as checkpoint inhibitors uh, was approved. Uh, since that time, uh, there has been a literal tsunami of uh, uh, clinical research uh, and approval of new agents, um, which brings us up to the present day. 2017, actually, uh, the uh, uh, ASCO uh, has made this uh, the uh, advance of the year, immunotherapy 2.0, with the development of CAR T cells, something I'm not really going to talk about, but uh, has its own stories in terms of uh, immunologic toxicity. Just to give you a, a little bit of an idea, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and do a little um, uh, searching, First of all, there are over 1,500 active clinical trials right now of all forms of immunotherapy. Uh, over half of them are involve uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And it's estimated there are over 100,000 patients in the United States alone on checkpoint inhibitor clinical trials. So this is, this is uh, very large. If you just look a few years ago, uh, this has increased by about a half a log uh, in terms of the numbers. In terms of discovery, uh, it's even more remarkable. Uh, there are over uh, 50 uh, putative uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors in development. Some are variations on a theme. Um, and these include uh, not only uh, inhibitors of checkpoints, but agonists of costimulatory molecules, all that can be used uh, combinatorially, um, uh, uh, creating a, a kind of an infinite number of potential um, uh, therapies um, to be uh, tried, and, and uh, criticism is now being uh, raised that um, there are too many things being tried right now, uh, lacking uh, fundamental um, uh, basic science uh, uh, rationale. Uh, the money involved in this is astronomical, and if we still have money in 2025, we'll, uh, uh, this is, we'll exceed $50 billion a year in drugs alone. So why talk about this at medical grand rounds? I, I think it's uh, a topic that is really appropriate for all of us. Uh, uh, I was uh, 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 making some comments earlier today that the, some back of the envelope um, calculations of the number of new patients with inflammatory polyarthritis from checkpoint inhibitors likely exceeds the number of incident cases of new rheumatoid arthritis uh, in, right now. So it, it's not a, a matter of academic interest. Clearly, uh, in the hospital setting, this is important. And I've already talked to some of the attendings who are, are talking about seeing such patients. So hospitalists, internists, um, uh, uh, of course. Every single specialist that I can think of, every single one um, has uh, some piece of this um, uh, action in terms of these toxicities. Um, uh, the, the, the major 
change came from understanding these in the context of clinical trials to now these drugs being disseminated um, in, you know, throughout the community practice of oncology. Uh, so there's a, there's a need uh, for this uh, uh, whole area to be appreciated outside the confines of major universities like this. So we need awareness, we need uh, diagnostic and therapeutic algorithms, and we need a lot of interprofessional uh, communication, uh, which I'll emphasize at the end. So let's just uh, you know, uh, uh, go back and, and, and just uh, uh, take a reductionist view of what's going on here. This is a, a kind of a, 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 a quintessential uh, a view of activation of adaptive immunity. We, we're seeing T cells, uh, a naive T cell responding to uh, its cognate antigen. And over the period of a week, rounds and rounds of clonal expansion, um, multiplying by multiple log phases, um, uh, with, uh, in, in less than a week, uh, one cell may turn into nearly a million cells. And then uh, meeting the danger signal, whether it be an infection, responding to a vaccine, or some other sort of challenge. And then over the next uh, few weeks, um, there is uh, this uh, downregulation of immune activation. And this has to happen, or every time you get a cold, you develop a lymphoma. Um, uh, this period of expansion and contraction is tightly regulated, uh, and this has been the focus of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, immunotherapy trials. We talk uh, uh, fundamentally um, uh, about uh, T cell activation requiring um, uh, two signals. The first signal is delivered by uh, the T cell and its uh, clonal uh, T cell receptor, finding its cognate uh, 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 ligand, its antigen, presented in the context of self-MHC, that is not enough to turn a T cell on. And that's by design uh, uh, to protect us uh, from uh, widespread uh, T cell activation to self-antigens. It requires a second signal. This is a co-stimulatory molecule, uh, and there are multiple, but the one that is the most potent driver and the one that perhaps we know most about um, uh, is known as CD28, very important in naive T cells, nearly ubiquitously expressed, and it binds to a family of, uh, of, uh, of uh, antigens uh, that we often refer to as B7 family. Uh, CD numbers uh, not of consequence, uh, generally CD80 or 86. When both of these are activated, uh, we have cell proliferation, um, uh, cytokine production, uh, driving this to effector. So this is this is the the, the what uh, underlies that graph. At the same time, there are uh, there is a choreography of events that occurs uh, when uh, contraction uh, begins to occur. And this this uh, this deactivation phase um, uh, this uh, uh, occurs in secondary lymphoid organs um, uh, once uh, the danger signal has come to pass. There are two checkpoints that I, I will focus on today. Uh, one is known as CTLA-4, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, expressed on an activated T cell. It binds to that same B cell, uh, B7 family uh, more avidly. Um, and once it is um, uh, bound, uh, it uh, 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 initiates uh, a, a negative regulatory signal, uh, which uh, uh, ends uh, the phase of, uh, of uh, of uh, exponential T cell activation and proliferation. The mechanisms are multiple and, and really aren't important uh, to this discussion, but it is a central checkpoint um, and it's uh, 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 vitally important. Once those activated cells move into the periphery, uh, and this could be in the tumor microenvironment or if it's responding to an infection in the lung or uh, skin or other uh, end organ, uh, these cells um, uh, are active effectors. They're uh, potent at uh, secreting cytokines, inducing uh, cytotoxic uh, T cell reactions. Um, and uh, uh, if the danger signal um, cannot be readily uh, uh, eliminated, uh, a second checkpoint, uh, and this is known as PD-1, uh, expressed uh, on these activated T cells binding to uh, PD-L1, a ubiquitously expressed ligand and uh, another uh, uh, family member called PDL2. In the periphery, this causes these cells um, to undergo a process uh, 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 sequentially 
and that phenotypically we refer to as, uh, as the exhausted phenotype. And much of this work has been done here by uh, Rafi Ahmed, um, and uh, this is now uh, an, an area of great interest. So having said that, um, we have that initial uh, uh, cartoon of the person with the cold uh, uh, proliferating and you know, you got your two weeks to get rid of your cold. You have it for a few days, you keep it for a few days, you get rid of it for a few days, uh, you shuttle a few cells off into memory, these cells die away. In certain settings, um, chronic infections like HIV, hepatitis C, uh, chronic hepatitis B, and in the tumor microenvironment, you can't get rid of the danger signal. It persists. And if these activated T cells stay in those uh, regions, the host um, uh, is uh, profoundly affected uh, by this uh, adversely, uh, suffering the sequelae of uh, persistent uh, immune activation and collateral damage. So uh, they take on a, 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 this uh, persona of the exhausted T cell, um, which is phenotypically different. Uh, which is metabolically different, it is uh, 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 epigenetically different, um, it is less potent, less inflammatory. Um, and teleologically, I think this makes a lot of sense. You know, why do we need exhausted T cells? Um, it protects the host and it really creates a, a situation of immunologic detente or stalemate. Um, if you remove these exhausted T cells, HIV or hepatitis C will advance as will um, a, um, um, a, a, t a tumor. So attacking this um, is to attack the checkpoints. Um, these are the these are the brakes. When you take your foot off the brake, um, you know uh, what happens. Although I just heard a I heard a great talk the other day that uh, uh, actually was Abul Abbas. He gave, was talking about checkpoints in 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 England, and he said, you know, you take your foot off the brake, and what happens? And the guy said, nothing, because everybody drives a stick shift over there, and uh, you know, you got to kind of do the, it's a little, think about it. Uh, so you take, uh, this is a reductionist view, and uh, uh, this leads to uh, 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 elimination of the checkpoint in central lymphoid organs. In the periphery, uh, interdicting between PD-1 uh, or PD-L1 and their uh, 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 ligand, uh, ligand interaction, um, leads to reinvigoration of these exhausted T cells. This uh, 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 broadens the repertoire of uh, uh, these reinvigorated T cells, leads to uh, elaboration of inflammatory cytokines, um, and also uh, there's a prominent role of Tregs that I don't have uh, uh, time to go into that is uh, probably uh, belies uh, much of this revitalized immune uh, response. Now with that in mind, that's the basic biology, uh, we're reactivating this uh, 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 exhausted uh, immune response. Uh, these drugs now have been applied to a variety uh, of uh, uh, tumoral situations uh, with varying degrees of success. Uh, there are uh, six approved checkpoint inhibitors right now, uh, one uh, targeting CTLA-4, the other is targeting PD-1 or PD-L1. Um, and there is a growing list of indications. Interestingly, uh, monotherapy with uh, 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 anti-CTLA-4 uh, has been uh, uh, really only found uh, highly effective in the setting of, of, of uh, myeloma. There were a lot of disappointments when it was applied to peripheral tumors, but a few years ago it was appreciated that um, uh, uh, potentially targeting the PD-1, PD-L1 uh, pathway uh, may affect a, a variety of other tumors, and, and uh, these uh, clinical trials have now come to fruition. In a landmark uh, uh, FDA approval uh, of only a few months ago, um, the, the PD-1 agents uh, have now been approved um, in a tumor agnostic fashion. Tumor agnostic. I mean, this is really important. Think about this. You have a drug that's approved for cancer, uh, not the cancer of the uterus or lung or uh, Merkel cell, et cetera. The actual uh, 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 variable, the biomarker uh, that is required uh, to use this um, are one of several um, uh, uh, mutations uh, 
that uh, drive um, um, uh, tumor neoantigen formation. And while the actual biomarker assays lag behind the, the, the drugs, uh, think of it that any tumor that has a high mutation rate um, uh, may potentially uh, um, uh, be candidates for checkpoint therapy. This initial uh, uh, figures up here, uh, maybe a third of endometrial, one out of five colon, five percent of all of their tumors. So the, 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 the potential denominator continues to grow. I like to show these uh, uh, original slides because, you know, you don't have to be a statistician to understand that refractory and disseminated uh, melanoma can potentially uh, respond and respond dramatically. Four infusions, uh, enduring uh, response in perhaps one out of five, um, uh, and there are patients that are uh, surviving, you know, uh, 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 go, uh, approaching two decades uh, from the earliest uh, trials. So when it works, it works really well. But if you uh, can understand these um, overall survival curves, you see that the majority of people are not benefiting, but uh, this is a major step forward for a very severe tumor. Uh, I was welcomed this morning at the Atlanta airport by Jimmy Carter, who appears, appears to be just doing pretty great uh, 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 on checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and uh, that's the end of my clinical trial data. So now, you know, the, 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 the pan-Asiatic uh, yin and yang applies to everything, in my opinion, and it certainly applies to checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, from, the, uh, from the beginning, it was appreciated um, that patients uh, who were treated with these in clinical trials would develop um, end organ inflammatory complications um, that ranged from being, uh, you know, somewhat uh, 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 quizzical uh, to profound, um, uh, mild uh, to severe, uh, and uh, it was readily appreciated that uh, skin, uh, bowel, and endocrine organs uh, could be uh, 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 the downside of these therapies. And uh, indeed, this was the beginning. Um, if you really want to take a deeper dive into this, um, this is a, 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 a really an incredible narrative review from uh, Nature Medicine from uh, this past summer by uh, several uh, giants in the, the field of immunology, and really has raised the, the question that th this is not just a matter of curiosity. Um, this uh, may be um, uh, 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 much more profound than was originally thought, um, uh, and, and growing at a very fast pace. Before I talk about this, I just want to refresh your memory on the CTCAE classification of uh, uh, adverse events uh, in uh, uh, cancer therapeutic trials. Graded one through five, five is death, one is uh, uh, very mild, um, uh, requiring uh, mostly observation, two, three, and four uh, go from moderate to life-threatening, three is generally put you in the hospital kind of thing. So we're using these, and these work for most IRAEs, but as I'll point out, they don't work for all organ systems that are being seen right now, but I'll come back to that in the end. This is a little bit more um, uh, robust. This is a, a modified uh, figure that shows now um, uh, an increasing uh, spectrum of target organs that are involved, uh, uh, that uh, many of which were not appreciated in the, uh, uh, until several years after uh, these drugs were approved because you have to appreciate the, the flow of patients. This is now an exponential uh, flow of patients uh, coming under therapy. Rheumatic IREEs were not, uh, 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 were so poorly described in the clinical trials uh, databases that we had no inkling of them when these drugs uh, were ultimately approved. Just, just little, little hints. Um, similarly, uh, nephritis, largely interstitial disease, poorly appreciated, now appreciated to be quite common, um, and uh, a growing list of, of more boutique uh, complications um, that I, I'm sure in, in uh, this institution are, are being seen um, uh, every week. So uh, that's the 30,000 foot view. Let me make a few um, uh, 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 comments um, uh, 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 at high altitude. 
First of all, to give you just an idea of the scope of this, uh, it has been suggested that up to 90% of patients, um, per, um, particularly with high dose CTLA-4, will have some form of IRAE, 90%. I know most of these are grade one, but uh, this is, shows you how common. Um, looking at uh, 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 meta-analysis and looking at uh, more significant levels of toxicity suggests that um, uh, um, uh, significant uh, toxicity may be seen in three quarters of patients on anti-CTLA-4 and maybe one out of three with PD, PDL one These immune-related adverse events um, occur singly, but half the time the patient will have another one, either in parallel or tandem. So we see a patient with arthritis, they've already had um, uh, thyroiditis. Um, grade three complications, serious complications, put you in the hospital complications, may occur four out of ten with uh, CTLA-4 checkpoint inhibitor and one out of five with PD-1. So this is you know, if there's 100,000 people in clinical trials, so do the, do the math on, on, on what this could uh, mean. That's not in practice. Um, there are some aspects of this that we are now, uh, uh, that, are, uh, that are more clarion. Uh, there are some dose dependencies of these drugs, and we know that high frequency infusions and high dose infusions may be associated um, uh, with a greater degree of toxicity, and they differ depending upon the setting. If it's an adjuvant or being used in metastatic disease, there's a, a, a difference in um, uh, patterns of IRAEs. Finally, the mechanism of action of these uh, IRAEs, um, uh, 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 we know very little about them, but they appear to vary uh, based upon the checkpoint inhibitor um, um, uh, involved um, and uh, have uh, complex relationships to the acuity uh, and the chronicity of these diseases um, uh, and may occur in people who are doing just great on, on these uh, 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 agents. That's something I'll close with, um, which has been raised as a question, is uh, IRAE a, a good biomarker for uh, response? These are some more recent data to suggest that there's actually differences in these drugs. There's not just checkpoint inhibitors. Um, on the left, um, you can see these are uh, the frequency of uh, IRAEs in varying organ systems with CTLA-4, um, and on the right uh, side uh, with PD-1. And as you can see, separating out quite clearly uh, is a greater um, uh, risk uh, of uh, uh, colitis and hypophysitis, something that I'll talk about uh, a bit, um, uh, perhaps some skin, uh, but on the flip side, um, uh, uh, pneumonitis um, uh, and rheumatic uh, uh, are more common with PD-1. There's also an influence of tumor lineage. So if you have a patient, um, you know, before uh, non-small cell lung cancer uh, became a target of therapy, we never saw much in the way of pneumonitis at all. Now it's very, very common. Um, and whether that relates to the inflammatory nature of lung disease, you know, just to make an observation, you know, the Cantos trial of IL-1 and cardiovascular disease, you know, one of the major observations of that is that the frequency of lung cancer went down in the Cantos trial. I think that's telling us something uh, about inflammation, tumorigenicity, uh, particularly in the pulmonary band. The chronopharmacology of this is complex, and this is a kind of a Jeff Weber is a reductionist view of it again, but I think it's pretty accurate. These toxicities may occur within a few weeks or they may be delayed. I will tell you that rheumatic complications may delay, be delayed for uh, years um, uh, um, uh, uh, in their uh, uh, onset. And as you can see, virtually all of them, except for that blue line, show that they come and they go. So uh, de-challenge and immunosuppression often will fix these things up if you survive. The blue line for endocrine uh, toxicity, and in particular, this is hypophysitis. If you blow out your pituitary, your pituitary is gone. Um, the inflammatory phase is, is gone, but you required lifelong endocrine re replacement. So it just gives you a little flavor of what's going on here with these. Now let me give you a little whirlwind tour uh, as we uh, 
kind of uh, move uh, to talk about mechanisms. Uh, dermatologic aspects of this, here's a patient with dermatomyositis. Myositis can be seen in 2 to 3 percent of patients. Um, vitiligo uh, it appears to be related to tumor lineage, seen uh, virtually exclusively in patients with melanoma on checkpoint inhibitors. Um, more commonly, it's erythroderma or maculopapular rash. Uh, grade 4 and grade 5 uh, toxicities have occurred, dress syndrome, um, uh, TEN, uh, Stevens-Johnson, all have been reported in, in fatal forms uh, with these diseases. This is a patient of ours recently presented at, uh, I was telling the group that we have a, a, a IRAE tumor board now, it meets uh, every month, and it started as just a few interested people, and now uh, well, we have representatives, as I'm sure that you do, uh, from virtually every department who has a clinical interest in this, uh, and everybody meets uh, to discuss new cases. And this is a, a patient um, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, 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 a psoriaform severe onset um, uh, uh, rash uh, with uh, mucosal sparing um, uh, that occurred uh, virtually with every infusion uh, until it had to be uh, stopped. And interesting. Um, uh, biopsy showed uh, dense uh, uh, lymphocytic infiltrate uh, at the dermal epidermal junction. Um, these have been treated with anti-cytokine therapy um, uh, successfully, uh, by the way. Endocrine uh, adverse events uh, requiring treatment uh, are seen in up to 10 percent. Most of them are thyroid, um, um, uh, and a smaller percent involve uh, 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 adrenal gland uh, and pancreas. I don't have time to talk about all of these, but you probably are well aware that there are increasing numbers of patients presenting with acute type 1 diabetes, often with DKA presentations, who've had these um, uh, exposed to these agents. And uh, I'll mention that some of them who had stored blood um, uh, had uh, pre existing antibodies to islet cells before they ever were treated. And, has raised the specter that asymptomatic autoimmunity may be a risk factor for some of these patients. Probably the most interesting disease is this. I mean, before the onset of uh, a checkpoint inhibitor therapy, you know, who in here had taken care of a patient with, uh, with inflammatory uh, or autoimmune hypophysitis? I mean, in the pre-checkpoint era, in the pre-checkpoint era. Um, so uh, it's a very rare disease. Uh, in patients on um, CTLA-4, um, uh, this may occur in, in as many in high dose as uh, 1 in 20 patients. So taking a disease that was present in 1 per million to 1 in 20 is uh, pretty um, um, uh, uh, remarkable. Um, this is uh, uh, seen uh, uh, predominantly with CTLA-4 drugs, but also uh, uh, with uh, PD-1 targeting drugs. And obviously, uh, these patients can present um, uh, as insidious onset of hypopet. So they've had their drugs uh, here. They go back 100 miles away uh, to their home, and they come in, their family doctor, you know, they're, they're tired or run down. Well, you have cancer. I mean, all these patients are just looked at contextually as having a chronic disease. This requires a totally different shift in thinking. Uh, could this be early hypothyroidism? Could this be early hypopituitarism? Uh, and um, you know, screening uh, must be important. It was early on appreciated that colitis, uh, which is uh, an interesting form of colitis and has kind of an admixture of uh, pathological findings uh, um, uh, somewhere between uh, CUC and and, um, uh, and Crohn's disease can be grade 3 to 4 and 1 to 2 percent, and is often the cause of, uh, of, of uh, fatal uh, toxicity. In the first 300 patients treated with CTLA-4 monotherapy at Memorial, uh, which was reported a number of years ago now, it was interesting that out of those 300, 100 patients required glucocorticoid therapy um, to treat their IRAEs. 30 patients out of that first 300 required a TNF inhibitor to treat um, uh, an IRAE, and all of it was inflammatory bowel disease. What's interesting about this is that with D-challenge from the drug and usually one 
uh, at most two infusions of uh, generally infliximab, uh, an IV uh, anti-TNF, this uh, uh, goes away. So it's, 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 it's interesting if it's picked up, but patients who present with bowel cramps, diarrhea, need the usual differential diagnosis. Uh, it's not just uh, always this. Pulmonary adverse events, as I said, are, uh, appear to be tumor-specific and lineage and drug-specific uh, 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 PD-1, non-smell cell lung cancer. These are tough patients, and I'm sure that uh, everybody, this is ID deal, you see people in the unit, and um, uh, there's intensivists, and they're getting bronched. Um, the differential diagnosis is, is broad. There's this uh, case report which, uh, from uh, the Journal of Oncology, which I, I, I just love. This is all one patient. Uh, these are just different images. You know, it's kind of the blind man on the elephant. Is this, you know, advancing tumor? Is this a, a wedged infarct? Uh, is this consolidative uh, pneumonitis? Um, all of this. These all turned out to be uh, 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 IRAEs and uh, responded uh, to de-challenge and glucocorticoids. So just to give you a flavor, this is a patient we recently uh, saw with the uveitis group uh, uh, at the Cole uh, Eye Institute uh, presenting with uh, vision-threatening panuveitis, uh, chorioretinitis, um, uh, 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 who, in a patient who already had colitis. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, drug uh, um, uh, uh, was uh, uh, ultimately uh, uh, it went from dual therapy to monotherapy, treated with glucocorticoids, site was salvaged, tumor was in complete remission, um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, the, the algorithm to manage this uh, is, is, is soft, but uh, requires uh, uh, people talking to each other. So finally, I'll just uh, make a few comments about rheumatic complications, which is the business that got us interested in this. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a small story. So about two years ago, I got a call from um, Dr. Bingham at uh, Johns Hopkins, and he said, hey, are you seeing all these patients with these IRAEs? I said, no, I'm not seeing any of these patients. And he knew I was interested because I had written about the mechanisms and had done some uh, chatting about it. And he said, well, we're seeing tons of these at Hopkins. He goes, well, you guys are not referring them to you. So I said, uh, why don't you come up and give a talk? And came up and gave a talk, and I invited the, the uh, tumor immuno guys. And uh, well, it, we now see two to three patients a week. Um, and most of these patients were uh, being treated. They have aches and pains. They get a blob of cortisone, given analgesics. Uh, uh, very, very interesting uh, 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 evolution. It's just, it's a shift in thinking, and since we tar started the interdisciplinary uh, tumor board, and uh, we have a, a virtual kind of referral uh, system uh, based with advanced practitioners. The advanced practitioner in uh, oncology uh, when has a patient with um, uh, grade two to grade three uh, has an advanced practitioner in each of the um, departments uh, that are represented who will triage them uh, within uh, hopefully a, a couple days, and we try to accommodate their infusion schedule, obviously. What is interesting about the rheumatic complications is that they are nosologically distinct. They have uh, two features that are different. One, they can um, have a very delayed onset in um, uh, developing. People could be on these drugs for um, uh, a year or more uh, and develop inflammatory arthritis. And secondly, and most distinctively, and not shared by any other organ system that I am aware of, is that uh, particularly the inflammatory arthritis, 50% of them, when the drugs are stopped, they still have it. And it's for years now. They have a new disease. Um, and so it raises the issue of, of this. So why checkpoints in autoimmunity? Why is this happening? Well, I mean, there's a lot to think about here. There are animal models take these checkpoint inhibitors out of, uh, of uh, in preclinical models, uh, knock them out either uh, diffusely or conditionally, even just knocking them out of uh, CTLA-4 and Tregs, they develop this fulminant um, autoimmune disease, PD-1 uh, less fulminant and may look lupus-like. There's some um, uh, um, um, 
uh, perturbations of uh, PD-1 genes and certain forms of autoimmunity as well. There are two relatively recently described primary immunodeficiency diseases that I uh, 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 find of great interest, besides they have these great names, chai and latte, um, which are characterized by uh, failure to express a full compendium of CTLA-4. So these are, these are genetic, either uh, um, uh, haploinsufficiency or compound heterozygous uh, uh, mutations, but you don't have as much CTLA-4 as you should. Same as giving anti-CTLA-4 to a person. What happens? Well, yeah, they get hypogamma and they develop infections, but they have widespread um, uh, end organ inflammatory disease involving lung, brain, um, muscle, and joint. And we actually treat these people with abatacept, CTLA-4 IG, and they do uh, reasonably well. So there is a link between these molecules and autoimmunity to be, begin with. I made the point that uh, 1 to 2 percent will develop grade 4 life-threatening um, uh, IRAEs, and they can, affer, can occur in virtually any organ system, uh, some more than others. And then finally, you know, there's a, a, a very nice uh, integrative review uh, by uh, Postow and colleagues in um, uh, the New England Journal just from last month where he posits these four mechanisms, which I, 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 I throw in with. Um, one uh, uh, in the upper left-hand corner suggests that with T-cell reinvigoration and expanding of the T-cell repertoire, there are actually uh, 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 evidence uh, on a limited number of patients that there has been epitope spreading, possibly by antigenic cross-presentation, tumor getting beat up, uh, spewing out, um, uh, host uh, uh, antigens, um, and in two exquisitely studied cases of myocarditis showing uh, T cells of this, uh, with the same uh, 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 clonotypic receptor in tumor and in muscle tissue, um, uh, this certainly needs to be investigated more. Secondly, with this uh, reinvigoration of the immune system, there is an increase in uh, T cell activation and cytokine. And we know that uh, certain cytokine inhibitors, which have been used successfully, including uh, TNF inhibitors, IL-6 inhibitors, anti-L17 inhibitors, um, all have had uh, a, 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 at least a, a, some role to play in, in managing these diseases. The upper quadrant is interesting. I've mentioned the diabetes with pre-existing anti-islet cell antibodies. This has now been identified in more than a few handfuls of patients with inflammatory arthritis. The initial thinking was that most of these were seronegative, but increasing numbers of patients who have antibodies to uh, citrullinated protein antigens, or ACPA, were identified. And we've had two patients uh, uh, with ACPA-positive arthritis who, uh, on stored blood, were ACPA-positive uh, prior to starting, and uh, uh, a handful of others uh, have been identified at other centers right now. Uh, and we're currently screening patients uh, 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 pretreatment for that. And then lastly, there's some evidence of some off-target effects uh, that CTLA-4 may be expressed on host tissue, in particular um, uh, pituitary. These are just some thinking. A whole lot of work needs to be done. Um, there are now several uh, uh, algorithms uh, for managing this. This is the, uh, the group SITSI. It's a society for uh, Immunotherapy, uh, 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 immune therapy of cancer, um, and uh, multiple specialists contributed to this. It was just published a couple months ago. ASCO just published theirs this past two weeks ago. Uh, it includes every organ system, um, uh, at least a, a representative algorithm. The principles are, are, are straightforward. It has to be based on early recognition. You know, what has this patient, it's not enough to know that the patient has been treated for their cancer anymore. You know, we canonically think about that as, oh, they got chemotherapy, they're going to get an infection. They don't get infections with these. They get infections from the steroids they get to treat the IRAEs, but, um, you know, what drugs were they on? And there's six right now, you need to, to be able to identify them as checkpoint inhibitors. Um, good communication between oncologists and uh, consultants. Uh, the must rule outs are, have to be there. I showed you that picture of that lung. Uh, 
Is it uh, progressive malignancy? Is it uh, de novo autoimmune disease? Um, or is it uh, an infection or otherwise? The therapy is uh, a, a business in itself. Uh, I think the ASCO uh, guidelines are 38 pages long. Uh, but mild toxicities, you observe uh, grade two symptomatic therapy, sometimes low dose glucocorticoids for virtually all of these things. Grade three requires creativity. And uh, these are patients that may be treated with uh, more rational targeted therapeutics, uh, including anti-cytokine therapies um, uh, uh, and, and beyond. Um, at grade two, uh, uh, there needs to be uh, uh, back and forth communication between um, uh, uh, internist uh, or subspecialist and the oncologist. And some people have, uh, have suggested varying algorithms such as this, and I, I don't want to spend any time on it. But I, I would uh, suspect uh, uh, that you are engaged in some type of activity such as this. Um, most uh, major uh, centers uh, 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 with robust immunotherapy have interprofessional groups uh, uh, such as I've described. Um, uh, they, patients need to be promptly triaged to people who are genuinely interested in this. And there are great educational needs among all of us. That's why, uh, you know, this topic is increasingly arising in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, medical grand rounds. So I had, the, I had the privilege of writing this editorial last month um, on uh, the, some of the complexities that are unanswered in this area. And um, I'll, I'll just throw out some to close with. Well, first of all, um, it's important to know, so if you have one of these IRAEs, is that good or bad for your cancer? There's some tumor-specific data to suggest that it's actually probably good and that people who have IRAEs and actually IRAEs and stop therapy um, may have uh, favorable uh, observed responses um, uh, akin to uh, people continuing on therapy. So, you know, think about what you're actually saying. If your immune system kicks in, it's doing its job. So uh, whether that applies to other tumor uh, lineages, I don't know. Um, what about if you're doing great and you get a grade three toxicity? You're in the hospital, fatal, they have to stop the drug, get treated, now your tumor's doing good, can you go back on therapy? This is a big question, and, and clinical trials, no. But now in practice, people are trying to say, well, maybe I can treat this thing or prevent this thing, and maybe um, uh, I can switch drugs. You know, if I'm on combination therapy, I'll go to monotherapy. We showed you one patient did that with the eye. Uh, if they're on a PD-1 inhibitor, does it make any difference switching them to an anti-PD-L1 inhibitor? Some differences in, in their toxicity. This is an unanswered question and um, uh, in interesting. What about the 25 million people who have autoimmune diseases? They have multiple sclerosis or Crohn's disease or psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis or um, any of these diseases, all of those patients were censored in the clinical trials, all of them. So now, there's 25 million people developing cancer who want to know, can I get these drugs? And there's, the, the, there's a, uh, my commentary was uh, regarding a meta-analysis uh, that was done of the, you know, 127 patients that have been observed um, appropriately, and it appears that about half of them will reactivate but half of them won't. And uh, we, we need biomarkers to, to, to figure out uh, how to do this. Um, and then we're, we're getting these patients who reactivate, uh, who develop a, an IRAE, particularly rheumatic, who are chronic. And now they require disease-modifying drugs. A, will they be candidates for checkpoint inhibitors while they're on their disease-modifying drugs? And will those disease-modifying drugs blunt the anti-tumoral response of the checkpoint inhibitor? I mean, it's just a fundamental question with, without an answer. And then lastly, uh, we seriously need some uh, biomarkers uh, to help predict and avoid these things. And right now, uh, all, much, of the ev much of the effort has been on looking at biomarkers for efficacy of checkpoint inhibitors, and less so on predicting these. But um, I think there's a fruitful area. <clears throat> 
So, you know, I, 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 uh, I will stop with this, and I, I, I pulled up a couple minutes short. I'd love to hear anybody's experience or uh, questions or comments on this. I think this is something that we can be dealing with for the, for the long haul. So thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Um, we can start with any questions from the audience. I wonder if we are getting questions from the other sites as well. Or okay. Well, we'll make do. You know how how do they you know kind of relate in severity to those that you know we consider for conventional um, chemotherapy, and you know how comparable are the are the adverse event outcomes? I guess sort of between those two groups, understanding that they are very different. Yeah, well, they are. You know, grade fatal toxicities um, in the clinical trials have generally been in the range of about one percent, and. Uh, you know that that's that that's the the, the most important denominator, um, and uh, obviously the spectrum of these things are are far different. Um, uh, I, I suspect that in clinical practice, um, as you would, you know, uh, intuitively uh, probably um, suggest that that will increase because now you're treating people with comorbid conditions and. You're not, you're not as uh, pristine as going into these, but uh, you know I think that the 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 adverse events are frequent, but uh, 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 manageable and and tolerable. Um, uh, the serious ones are, are are rare. That's about as good as I can give you. But that's I mean you got it's a, it's an important question to ask. But I think that's why there's so much excitement. Hi, thank you so much. Um, from the rheumatology clinic side, I have a question. So I've seen a couple times in clinic, and actually not even my own patients, where oncology is working up a patient for a malignancy for treatment, and they're doing some antibody screening as part of the workup now. I've seen that twice, and like a row is positive, and they are declining uh, to use you know one of these drugs. And I know there are no guidelines for it, but in your experience. Yeah. So anyway, we're, we're, we're doing a, a, a very simple um, uh, trial right now. So for the past uh, three or four months, um, we have added on a, a drop-down um, table uh, with a, a fairly detailed um, family history of uh, 20 common autoimmune diseases in first uh, or second degree relatives over here. And then uh, we have been performing uh, ANA profiling, uh, ACPA, uh, rheumatoid factor, and um, acute phase reactants, uh, and uh, CRP and, and SED rate. And we're just in the process of, of uh, 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 collecting this first 100 people. You know, it, it's interesting to note that, that the, the, you know, the, the, if you say, well, you're checking CRPs in a patient with cancer, I mean, some are absolutely non-detectable, others are very elevated. Some of these adverse events appear, they have to involve innate immunity. I have seen patients who in the same day of getting infused with a, a, a PD-1 agent have developed this like fulminant polymyalgia syndrome to the point that they can't get out of bed by morning. And you know, 20 or 30 of prednisone melts it totally away within hours to, to, to minutes uh, of the infusion. So I don't know, that, that is a biomarker trial. Uh, the oncologists are on board for it, but we haven't censored anybody from being treated for this at all. And we also uh, are encouraging them, um, uh, it, it, for all the patients who have autoimmune disease, to be followed prospectively. So we're, we're, uh, that's where the money's at. You know, 
the name of the game is treating the cancer and getting the patient to survive. That's what it's all about. So if they have bad rheumatoid arthritis, send them to us. You know, let, let us figure this out and let them get the optimal therapy. So, I mean, that, that should be, every specialist should be saying the same thing. Right? That, that, that's what we want to happen. So, and, and it's great. So uh, there is an effort actually now to design clinical trials for patients with established autoimmune diseases that will go on checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and a lot of that is the same group that you mentioned from the recommendations. Uh, we will be doing one uh, on SLE, presumably. Uh, and that is in the working stages right now. So, um, oh, I, I look forward to hearing uh, about it. I mean, I think that, that that's that, that's what needs to be done. I mean, uh, 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 you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, blind men on the elephant here. And, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, been working with a, a couple groups, uh, the MD Anderson, the Hopkins group, uh, and uh, we, we, at our national meeting, the uh, American College of Rheumatology, we did this study group thing. We thought we'd have like 50 people. We had 250 people come because everybody's genuinely interested in trying to figure this out, so uh, it, it, we need to some better communication. It's great. Yeah, so the MD Anderson will be doing the lupus as well, and Hopkins is thinking about a GCA study. Yeah, we talk, I, I, that, that take a long time for that one, but uh, uh, I, I think it's important. Great. Any other questions? I wonder uh, if you could say just a few more words about the ACPA um, citrullinated proteins. Yeah. Um, my lab studies neutrophils, and you know that's you know where that some of that literature is based yeah. on net formation. Um, is that why? Uh, is there nets in the tumors, or what? What is known? You know, I, I, these the the observation I share with you are uh, you can count them on your fingers and toes. So. You know, just thinking ahead, we know that people who have ACPA, uh, who, uh, who people who have rheumatoid arthritis may have ACPA 10, 15 years before the onset of any type of clinical illness. So there's this phase of that we refer to as asymptomatic autoimmunity. And the immunologic events that go on between the development of autoantibody and, and the development of the disease are, are still poorly understood. You know, there's altered uh, glycosylation patterns on the antibodies, there's uh, uh, increasing titers, uh, increasing diversity. Um, the few patients that have been described in the literature that did what I told you on, on checkpoints, it's just an observation that prior to their checkpoints, they had them in their blood and they had no, nothing that sounded like rheumatoid arthritis, they haven't been studied in detail, but those are all great questions. Any more questions? If not, uh, thank you very much. Great.